welcome you and um, say greetings. I just heard my voice kick in. So. My name is Jamie Jackson. I get to serve here as the executive director and chief operating officer. And uh, that makes this morning extra special for me. I oftentimes see all sorts of things happening, but to be really a part of it this morning is just extra special. So again, so glad that you're here. Now, if you're here this morning, whether it's online or right here in the, the morning, um, I want to, I guess if you're online, it might be harder, but if you're here and it's your first time visiting, I want to especially welcome you and invite you to stop by our welcome tent, which is just through the south doors. And there we have some more information about Ocean Grove, and we also have a gift for you. So again, if you want to find out a little bit more about what we're doing here in the camp meeting, and if this is your first time in the great auditorium, please stop by. We'd love to meet you in person and give you a gift. Well, this morning it's my privilege to call us together in worship. And so what I'd like to do is ask you if you're able to stand with me as we begin the service in scripture and then praise. Revelations chapter 4 says, Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being.
would you please remain standing and join me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Holy and almighty God, we come to you this morning in thanksgiving. In thanksgiving for all that you have blessed us with. We recount in our hearts those moments that you have given us eyes to see your love, grace, mercy, and redemption in our lives through Jesus Christ. We come to you, Almighty God, this morning with an attitude of confession. For we have sinned. We have not loved you with our whole heart. And we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We call on you in the name of Jesus Christ to forgive us, God. We invite your Holy Spirit to awaken us to your presence every moment in our lives and the world around us. Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear the voice of our Lord and Savior We come to you, God, with thoughts and feelings for those people around us that we know. Our family, our friends, our co-workers, fellow students. And God, during the next moment of silent prayer, we lift them to you so that you might do what you do best. So that they might see you working in their lives for good, for love. Hear our prayers, God. We come to you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, that deliver us from evil. For the land is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, this morning I also get to do some announcements, and I wanted to start off um, with first sharing a few highlights. Um, I hope you've been here all week and uh, have experienced many different opportunities for spiritual birth, growth, and renewal. And it's amazing to me, if you, I'm tempted to ask, if you were here just 12 hours ago in this very room, you would have seen a completely different look. Um, we had a concert here last night um, that was just fantastic, but the stage was transformed into really a concert venue. And here's the best part. That concert, without question, was about worship and praising Jesus. And uh, it was just thrilling to see it. So um, all throughout the week, though, there's been things happening in this very room. There's been organ recitals. There's been tours happening. And of course, all throughout Ocean Grove, there's all sorts of things happening. And one of the things that happened that was uh, just a, a highlight of every season that was here exactly a week ago was the choir festival. How many were here for the choir festival? Absolutely um, an amazing time together. Almost 2,000 people gathered here. And again, worship. It was just fantastic. Now, every year at the choir festival, we, we take a special offering. And this year, and, and this has happened in the past, but this year there's a very special group of donors who came and made a very generous gift. And they wanted it to be a challenge to all of us. So they put it out there and said, challenge everybody to, to give at the same level. And I get to report how we've done on that. It's pretty exciting. We are at 91% of reaching that goal. Now, I'm gonna, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this or not, but I'm gonna give you some real numbers with that. So what does that mean? That means right now we've received almost $120,000 through the choir festival to support all the programming here. I want to say thank you. It's that kind of generosity that keeps the camp meeting going, that keeps the choir festival going, so thank you. And I'd be remiss if I did not say we're at 91%. It's not too late. So if you want to contribute, if somehow you missed that moment, it's okay. You can write a check, just put in the memo line Choir Festival <laughs> Challenge. Um, if you prefer to give online, that's fantastic too. If you go to oceangrove.org slash give, when you fill out that, there's a comment field. Just put in there Choir Festival Challenge, and then your gift will also be counted towards that. So just can't thank you enough for your support in that. It's been fantastic. Well, I'm going to try something this morning, and I don't know, this, might, this, this may not be a great plan, because you know, there are, I mean, literally hundreds of programs and things going on, and I thought it might be fun for our announcements. I'm going to try to point out one for each day. So I'm going to go quickly, but let's see if we can do these. And I admit these are probably some of my favorites. But today, at 3.30 in the Tabernacle, we have Songs on a Summer Afternoon. You don't want to miss that one. Um, tomorrow and all week, starting at 9 a.m., it's Bible Hour. And if you've not been able to the Bible Hours yet, um, I just can't encourage you enough to come. It is just a fantastic opportunity to sit down and truly receive the Word and study. It's so good. So that happens every day. Tuesday, I got stumped. I got to give you two. So Tuesday, we have a, a Bible study called the Romance of Redemption, and that's being led by Karen Pulley. You might know her from Calvary Chapel. She's going to be leading that um, over in Thornley Chapel, and uh, should be just a fantastic Bible study. Um, and that's at 11.15 in the morning, but also at 7 p.m. down on the beach, near the pier at the beach stage, there's Pastor Raphael and Allie are going to be doing worship and the Word. So you kind of have your pick, morning or evening, um, but really those are great opportunities. Okay, that takes us to Wednesday. This is a great one. Wednesday at 9 p.m. Now, I probably shouldn't say this. That's close to my bedtime, I think, okay? But at 9 p.m., it's just 30 minutes, and that is um, the prayer song. And let me, let me throw this out here. If you have trouble going to sleep, you should come do this. You might be very amazed at how focusing on the Word, how focusing on the Lord 
blesses you when you go to fall asleep. So that's Wednesday night, 9 p.m. That's over in the tabernacle. I um, invite you to that. Thursday evening at 7.30, Summer Stars Classical Series, The Serenade of Strings. That's right back in here in the great auditorium. It's a fantastic program there. Friday evening, Beach Movie. How many have kids who've been to the beach movies here throughout the years? It's, I don't see one hand, oh my goodness. Well, it's a fantastic time to come throw out a blanket, grab a beach chair, and watch a movie on the beach. And uh, we always have a lot of kids that come out for that. It's a ton of fun. Saturday, 10 a.m., our Ladies Auxiliary is having their Thrifty Threads clothing sale. So that's happening Saturday morning. That's right over at the uh, pavilion, right adjacent to this building here. And then, Every day, there are gospel music ministry events happening either down at the Boardwalk Pavilion or even up at the Tabernacle. Um, every day, without exception, you can find some of those. And also, every day, actually, I'm not sure if that's true. It's at least Tuesday and Thursday, but you can find them, and that is Fitness, Faith, and Fun. And that is a recreation and fitness program, um, all sorts of opportunities to get involved there. So tons of things going on and why is that we kind of go overboard because we really are trying to create as many opportunities for you as possible opportunities with a purpose and the purpose is for spiritual birth growth and renewal and we certainly hope you can take advantage of those Amen. all right this morning it is my pleasure to welcome our preacher ron ball you know, it's not too often that you get to introduce somebody who has literally spoken and have impacted millions of people through speaking engagements in his writings, and that is Ron Ball, millions of people. And I learned something this morning that I thought was pretty fun. He's been here before. The last time he was here was probably 10 plus years ago, but it was with uh, Dr. Charles Stanley. And so uh, that's pretty fun to have him come back and be a part of our service now. Once again, we're so glad you're here. And I would like to also um, pray for our offering and invite you to give generously. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, when we think of all of the activities and events, and we think of all of the ways that you are lifted up that your name is magnified. All of the different ways that people get an introduction to Jesus. Father, already we've heard stories of how your spirit has moved and how lives have been transformed. And so, Lord, it's, it's natural for us to just want to say thank you. Lord, we give you thanks for what you're doing through the Ocean Grove Camp Meeting. And so now, Lord, we ask that as we continue with our thanksgiving, as we continue to give our offerings to you, we ask that you would bless those, that you would multiply those gifts. Lord, that those gifts would go to empowering this ministry, that we could bring even greater glory to you. And we pray this in faith, knowing just as you're doing it today that you will do it in the future. So even more, we say thank you. And we pray all of this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
morning. What a wonderful opportunity to worship. Thank you, choir. That was exhilarating. Uh, just less than two months ago, my daughter and her husband and our two small grandchildren came to visit our home in Kentucky for Memorial Day. We had everything ready, all prepared as grandparents do. And at the end of their visit, our three-year-old grandson, Levi, wanted to take a few extra minutes to play in our backyard. Now, there's nothing unusual about our backyard. It is totally ordinary. But Levi was eager to take a few more minutes in the backyard. So he went to his mom, my daughter, his dad. Can I please have five more minutes? Now, to a three-year-old, five more minutes means anything he wants it to mean. So he gets ready to go out the back door, and he steps off these rear steps, and I'm behind him, and he suddenly stops, and I'm going to do my best three-year-old imitation. It may not be great, but I'll try. Levi, three years old, steps out, looks at our very ordinary backyard, throws his arms up, and says, this place is amazing. Well, that's the way I feel about Ocean Grove. Amen. This place is amazing. Amen. And I have wonderful family members. My wife's parents from Monmouth Beach, and they're in the back. And uh, I have family relatives from Middletown, and they're here. And, and you're here. So I have something very special to give you this morning. And I have been praying about this for weeks until I had a tremendously clear sense of exactly what I believe God wanted me to tell you today. And you're about to hear it. Now I'm going to start with something that sounds a bit more down than I like to start with. But it actually happened, and it's important for what I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes. Less than three weeks ago, my wife and I were traveling. And at midnight, we were already asleep, at midnight, my cell phone rang, and it was our son, Jonathan. Jonathan is an assistant district attorney in the Eastern District of Kentucky. And he has jurisdiction over the state police in that region. And Jonathan was calling to tell us that there had been a terrible incident in our small town, and that a man had lured some of our police personnel and some of our first responders into a terrible ambush, and a number of people have been killed. A few hours later, I got up, and Jonathan, who had already been briefed on this, gave me a little more information. We hurried home and found that three of our policemen and a number of other individuals had been shot after responding to a domestic violence complaint, trying to help a woman and her daughter. Now, these were individuals we knew. One of the officers killed was my cousin. This was a wrenching incident in our community three weeks ago. And I remember attending viewings and funerals. But the thing that moved my heart the most were the Christian individuals in those families who had such a sense of the presence, support, power of God at that moment. Amen. You could walk in and feel the presence of God's Spirit in those auditoriums. We had thousands of people arrive from different parts of the state. The governor came. Our daughter, Allison, is the state treasurer of Kentucky in her second term. And she cleared her schedule, came to all the funerals for four days. But at the end of all that, a pastor stood on an auditorium stage in our town and announced that God was not defeated by the sinfulness of those actions. Amen. And that's my focus to start this morning. We need God's help in America. Amen. We need God's help right now. Amen. We need awakenings. We need revival. We need spiritual renewal. 
not far from here, in 1857, a man named Jeremiah Lanfear was hired by a Dutch Reformed church on Fulton Street in New York City. He was hired to go door to door and invite people to church. He was a business guy. He wasn't a pastor, but he agreed because he had a deep and powerful commitment to Jesus Christ that compelled him. And he said, yes, I'll do it. So he worked very hard, he put up signs, and he announced a prayer meeting for businessmen. And at that point, it was almost all businessmen. Sorry, ladies. This was 1857. And he announced it. And when he arrived at the location, there were six men. Six men. Now, Lanfear was not discouraged. He said, if God can change the world with 12 disciples and one was lost, that he can change New York with six men who were willing to pray. So that's what they did. And there began one of the great awakenings of that century. It spread all over the United States. By 1858, every city in America, every major city in America was having prayer meetings of businessmen who closed their businesses all day and just prayed. Over 100,000 businessmen came to Christ as their savior in the first six months. And the world was watching America at that point. A pastor in England named Charles Spurgeon got word of what was happening. And so he encouraged people to pray in London. And soon prayer revival spread to Australia and Asia and all over Europe. And it continued for almost two years until the American Civil War. God created an awakening out of six individuals who came with all their heart to just pray. Amen. I was a sophomore at Asbury College when we went to chapel one morning on a Tuesday, expecting nothing unusual. And there was a young man, I knew him, I was a sophomore, he was a senior. He was <clears throat> over in the back rear part of the auditorium, and he was like the class clown, super jock, could play anything, any sport, super popular. And at the end of our chapel that morning, as we started to have our benediction closing and go back to class, he stood up and he just stood there and stood there and stood there. And everybody's watching, wondering what in the world's going on. And then he spoke. And he said, I've been in this school for four years, a Christian college, and I've never known Jesus Christ. And he said, I cannot leave without knowing Christ in my heart. And he walked to the front. And that was the beginning of what is now known as the Asbury Revival, the Asbury Awakening. I lived through that. It was the most extraordinary experience of the presence of God. Most of it was very quiet. It was not exuberant or demonstrative. There weren't great displays of emotion. It was very deep and powerful. You would sit there in the presence of holiness and you were overcome, overcome overwhelmed with the presence of God. Amen. I remember standing in the back of the auditorium. This went on for weeks. I stood in the back of the auditorium one Wednesday evening and two women had driven up in a brand new Mercedes, got out of their car, walked up. They were dressed fantastically and uh, walked up to me. I was a student, only one there. And these two women said, we heard God is doing something great here and we want to be a part of it. And they started to walk down into the auditorium and one of the two women stopped. I was watching. One of the two women stopped and took off her shoes. And she said, this is holy ground. Amen. I have to honor God. And they went back and just, I watched them as they prayed for almost two hours. A reporter came from San Francisco, hard, harsh, and hostile to God. And I watched him come to Christ. And I heard from him several years later, still following Jesus because he just walked into an auditorium full of God and was overwhelmed with the need to know Christ. I remember on another occasion, a young man came, and I'm not trying to be super crazy controversial here, but I saw this happen. I watched a young man, 20, 
eight years old who had been injured severely in a car wreck come in in a wheelchair, could not walk, and I watched him walk out of the auditorium. I watched him. The power of God was so awesome. It was an awakening. It was deep and it was moving. One pastor came and stood behind a podium like this, and I remember what he said. Now, God bless pastors. <laughs> I mean, I spent five years as the associate pastor of the First Baptist Church of Atlanta with my friend Charles Stanley, so, so God bless pastors. But this particular pastor stood up, and there may be about 800 of us in there, and he stood up to confess, and I still remember what he said. He said, I have been so consumed with sexual lust in the chambers of my imagination. I still remember his phraseology, the chambers of my imagination. And he said, I'm here tonight to make things right with God, with my wife, with my family, because I cannot live another day without being right with God totally. I remember that moment. The most awesome moment for me was early one chilly March morning when I had just been to the cafeteria for breakfast and I was walking across the campus and suddenly without any warning, I heard this incredible music. It was like a choir I'd never heard before. I, I heard it all over the campus area. It was excruciatingly beautiful. It was, it, it was music that just melted your heart before God. The voices were indescribable. And I looked and there were pockets of students standing all over the campus, just looking and listening, trying to locate the source of this extraordinary, miraculous music. And I went into the auditorium where the revival, the center, the epicenter of the awakening. I went in that morning, and, and when I walked inside, the music was everywhere. And you were just overcome with a desire to love God and honor Him and obey Him. And it became worshipfully powerful for the next 20 minutes. And then as if you flipped a switch, it was over. It just stopped like that. It just ended. And I sat there with hundreds of students crying and weeping, realizing that we had heard angels. We'd experienced a window into heaven. It went like that on our campus for weeks, and no one individual led it. It wasn't a personality thing. It wasn't somebody up, some great preacher leader doing it. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was God taking command Amen. and moving in power and overwhelming us with his presence. That's what happened with Jeremiah Lanfear. That's what needs to happen again. That's what needs to happen beginning this morning. Amen. Now let me give you, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, Lord, revive us again that your people may rejoice in you. You know that verse, many of you. Well, what does that really mean? What is a revival, an awakening? What does it really do? Four simple things. Number one, a true awakening, a true spiritual explosion, a true movement of God. Number one, remind you of God's reality, that he's not a figment of the imagination, he's not a fairy tale, he's not a myth. He is the Lord God Almighty, and he lives today in power and rules the universe. He is God the Lord himself. And a revival and awakening is a fantastic reminder of the reality of God. Amen. That's what happened at Asbury all those years for us. We were reminded hourly of God's reality. Number two, it is a reestablishment of God's principles. Remember the pastor who said, I want to be clean. I don't want to live in, in the darkness of all this lust in the chambers of my imagination. He was reestablishing God's principles in his life, God's principles of holiness and God's principles of obedience. He was reestablishing God's principles. That's what revival does. Number three, true revival and awakening reaffirms God's plan, which is what? The Bible says in the New Testament, God doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. So God uses awakenings to draw men and women to Jesus Christ as the Savior. So it is a reaffirmation of God's plan. And then, I love this one, it is a reconnection to God's power. Amen. 
When I walked into the first funeral viewing three weeks ago for my cousin, and he was a good man who protected and loved our small, sleepy community in eastern Kentucky. And I walked up to his 20-year-old son, and I walked over to his wife, who we know, my, my wife sees her every week, Sherry. And I walked in, and I was praying for some way to minister to them, and they ministered to me. Because all they could talk about was how God's power sustained them. God's power held them. Well, that's what an awakening does. That's what a spiritual revival does. It is a reconnection to the power of God and a reminder that our solutions cannot just be political or economic. They have to be spiritual. They have to be God. Now, I'm not saying we can't be good citizens. We should be. But at the same time, we cannot remember the core, forget the core, the vital truth that we need God's power and we need to reconnect to that power. His is the power we need. When a real awakening happens, there is no escape from the searchlight of God's holiness. He exposes everything, every sin, every bad attitude. Every time you said something mean about your sister-in-law, every time you criticized your husband and embarrassed him, every time you complained, every time you were full of negative anger, every time you did anything that doesn't exhibit the Spirit of Christ, God's holiness in a revival exposes that. He exposes our attitudes, our intentions, our motivations. But not only that, a revival also teaches that there's no substitute for God's presence. God's presence. God's presence. There's no substitute for Him. There's no substitute for His connection to us. And then a revival, an awakening, does one more simple thing. It is another reminder that there's nothing sturdier than God's support. Nothing sturdier. Nothing sounder than God's support. So what a revival or an awakening really does, it creates a focus on God and not your problems. It, it is a renewal. That's why it's called a revival, a, a return to life and vitality and power where God moves. And we're a part of that flow and that process. Now, I want to do a quick wrap-up by giving you a simple list of what you can do to help revival come. Now, you can pray, and you can call on God, and you can ask for God to move, and yes, 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 do that all the time. Yes, yes, that's great. But I want to give you some personal things you can do, all right? Number one, ask God to make you clean. To clean out sinfulness and bad attitude and, 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 and wrong motivation and all those things that cloud the picture and, and block the flow of God's power. All those blockages, just pray they be cleaned out. And number two, ask God to make you clear on His truth, clear on what to stand up for, clear on what to Fight for, clear on God's principles, clear on God's holiness. To be clean and to be clear is very powerful. And then number three, be committed. But be committed to what? Well, really, it's not a what, it's a who, isn't it? It's committed to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You cannot connect to the power of God just by being in a church or an auditorium. You cannot connect to the power of God just by intellectually believing there is a God. The Bible says even the demons believe in God. So that's not the secret. What is it? It is a personal relationship and experience with the Savior, with Jesus Christ, accepting his death for you on the cross, that he rose from the dead for you, and then you open your heart and re you receive him. Revelation 3.20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock, if you hear my voice, open the door. I will come in and set up residence in your life. 
So it's a relationship with Christ. That's the commitment I'm talking about. So you need to be clean, you need to be clear, you need to be committed. Fourth, you need to be compassionate. We need to show more love than anybody else. We need to show more compassion than anybody else. That doesn't mean we deviate from God's standards and we do not deny God's truth and we do not fail to support God's principles, but we're compassionate while we stand for truth. And then last, you need to be compelling. That means you need to be attractive. There's a fascinating index, international index, called the Soft Power Index 30. And it's a list of the 30 countries in order that are most attractive, most compelling to live there. Uh, every year since the index was done, except for 2019, the only year it didn't make it, uh, the United Kingdom, England, was at the top of the list as being attractive and, and compelling. Well, that's what Christians should be, attractive and compelling. We should be so winning that anybody would want to know Jesus. We should be so good to people that anybody would be drawn to Christ. We should be the greatest advertisement for Jesus that exists. Amen. And that has power. Now, let me wrap it up like this. Yes, be clean, be clear, be committed, be compassionate, be compelling. There's one more thing I want to give you before I finish. A lot of years ago, I met a remarkable man from England who had a profound effect on me. I only spent three days with him, but the influence of this man's life continues to affect me. You may have never heard this name. You may be unfamiliar with this individual. In the 60s, he wrote several best-selling Christian books that I think may actually be out of print now, although they're very powerful. The man's name is Leonard Ravenhill. And I spent three days with him. And he was a student of awakenings and revivals and spiritual movements. And at the end of my time with him, he said something that I carry with me to this day. I carry it right now. It's still in my heart. This is what he said. He said, the real reason we do not have great spiritual awakenings today, the real reason we do not have great sweeping revivals today is because we have become content to live without them. Amen. We have become content to live without them. Well, while you become clear, committed, compelling, compassionate, all of these I listed, don't become content with the way things are. Amen. Don't be content to live without God's power, presence, and spiritual awakenings. I knew two months ago, this is the 17th of July, this would have been around the 15th of May, so about two months ago, I knew two months ago that I had been invited to Ocean Grove this morning because God wanted me to call you to revival. Amen. I knew that two months ago. I have been eagerly waiting for this moment <laughs> just to call you to revival. <laughs> and I want you right now, we're going to have a moment of prayer. And I'm going to invite you right now to make a real commitment right where you are. If you want to come down to the front, that's fine. I know we still have some music and a benediction, and I don't want to mess that up, although I may, I may already have. But I want you right now to be sure, number one, that you know Jesus as your Savior. Because no amount of religion can replace a relationship with Christ. So you need to make sure you really know Jesus in your heart. But then those many of you who are Christians, and most of you probably are, make this the moment of awakening in your heart. First Peter, what does the Bible say? If awakening cannot begin with the house of God, where can it begin? Right here, right now. Right here, right now. Why don't you pray for God to do an awakening in your marriage, an awakening with your children, Amen. awakening in your family, a spiritual awakening in this place that will spread throughout New Jersey and shock America. 
a spiritual awakening that will change the world for God. Let's just bow in prayer for a moment. Just for a moment. If you want to be a part of that kind of awakening, then you can pray that in your seat or you can come here to the front. But I want you right now to just really obey God. Lord, awaken me. Lord, revive me. Let it start with me right here, right now. If you want to come here to the front, some people are coming down. Come right here. Let's just take a moment to pray at the front. If you want to make a public recommitment or a public renewal or a public resurrender or even the first time you've ever done it, we'll take just a moment. And you'll be out of here soon. But just a moment. You can come right here to the front and say, God, start this with me. Start this with my children. Start this with my grandchildren. Change America starting with me. And you can pray the prayer in your seat too. That's fine. But I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. If you want to come down to the front and pray, you come while I'm praying. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. This is not the benediction. That's coming in a few minutes. But I want to lead you in a prayer of surrender. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for Ocean Grove. Thank you for Jamie and his team and all these individuals who've already contributed in a special way to this, this choir, these ushers, people who are committed to this place because they love you. Well, I pray right now that a great awakening will start here. Wouldn't it be awesome if the history of Ocean Grove someday reads the next great awakening started at Ocean Grove? Amen. Lord, we pray that will begin in our hearts today. Lord, lead us to love you, know you, obey you, and follow you in the name and on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I think we're going to have some music, Joe. Is that right, Jamie? All right. And you can pray as long as you like. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.
Father in heaven, I pray now your benediction upon this service, upon these men and women, upon their families. I pray the blessing of God would rest on them, the power of God would fill them, the peace of God would support them, and the guidance of God would direct them. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. amen.